thank you very much for the invitation. I will not be original by saying that I'm, of course, very honored to speak in this seminar. So uh, what I'd like uh, to talk about is the main theme of the talk is uh, a law of small numbers. And by that, I mean that uh, I wanna give you yet another example of the phenomena uh, where which something that seemed to be absolutely true at the beginning fails miserably uh, as we go along. And the more conventional outline of the talk uh, is that um, I'll start by talking um, about some classical results, zeros of polynomials. And then uh, I will move on and talk actually about the zeros of special class of polynomials, which is the faculty polynomials. And I'll tell you what we know about that. And then I'll mention a couple of uh, new results and um, the ideas that go into that. Um, and then I will move on and perhaps do some speculations and about some failed attempt to prove something towards these speculations. So uh, the main theme of the talk is that, okay, well, given a polynomial um, with a complex coefficients, uh, what can we say about the zero set? And of course, uh, as far this question is too general uh, to ask, so here is the picture that many of you have seen, I guess, at least if you watch Lord of the Rings. So this is a, um, so what is pictured here is the zero sets of the polynomials uh, with the coefficients plus minus one in degree up to 24. And of course, one can see immediately here that there is uh, an interesting phenomena which is happening. So all these zeros, so many of those zeros tend to equidistribute equi uh, around the unit circle. So there is a huge concentration there. And uh, well, as far as this phenomena is uh, concerned, uh, the key to explain in this is the theorem, very classical result of Erdős and Turan, um, which uh, basically says, if I'm giving you a polynomial um, and uh, I look at the arc and I look at all zeros that are uh, inside this, the arguments of this zeros are inside the arc, then the number of the zeros uh, minus the expected number is upper bounded by this quantity on the right, which is square root times the uh, logarithm of the mother measure. And so if the coefficients are bounded by say one, then uh, of course the, uh, this mother measure contribution is uh, at most log n. And so the difference is, uh, what you can see here is a good discrepancy bound. So what about the real zeros? Uh, so the real zeros, if you take your arc to be very close to the point one, then uh, essentially that will exactly tell you how many zeros are in this small sector, which correspond to the real zeros. And uh, so that would give you the bound of, um, of square root of log n, at least in the class of this Littlewood polynomials. So these are coefficients plus minus one and Littlewood uh, written extensively about them at the end of his life. So um, it took another about 50 years when um, Borbel and Erdely and Koch, they actually shaved down this square root of log n factor. And uh, what they managed to prove that the square root bound, which is actually sharp as far as the real zeros are concerned. So this is as far as the extremal number is concerned. And um, in terms of the what happens with the typical polynomial with coefficients plus minus one. So I'll mention here, there is enormous amount of results about that, but I, I'll mention just the three very classical ones. So the first one is due to Littlewood and Offord, who proved that um, actually the it's actually not the word expected, but uh, so they proved that for almost all choices of polynomials, the upper bound is actually log squared of n. And it took some time where uh, uh, this development around the cuts rise formula. And um, so uh, this result was generalized um, to the random multiple, uh, random polynomials with the coefficients plus minus one, uh, with, with the Gaussian coefficients. And so uh, the result is that the expected number of zeros is proportional to two or pi log n. And then, um, so 
it took another uh, time to generalize it to non-smooth distributions where the number of, uh, where the coefficients are random Bernoulli plus minus one, and then Abdush and Offord showed that this is also uh, proportional to, uh, to over pi log n. Okay, so these are these results that I want to, uh, to keep in mind. And at least the bounds of square root and logs in the family of such polynomials. So I'm going to move now to the actual topic, which is uh, talking about the specific class of faculty polynomials. So what are those polynomials? So these polynomials are uh, polynomials where you stick the, as a coefficients, Legendre symbols. And so for primes, this is just a Legendre symbol. And for positive, uh, if you consider a positive fundamental discriminant, then you can replace it by the Kronecker symbol. And the key, uh, the starting point is that uh, of all this uh, works around the subject is um, that if you Mellin transform your polynomial, faculty polynomial, as an output on the left hand side, you get an L function, Girish L function. And the story begins with Fekete, uh, who at the beginning of the 20th century, he observed that, um, well, if f of d, if my polynomial doesn't have zeros between zero and one, then the integrand on the right-hand side is positive. And therefore, there is no sign change on the left-hand side. And therefore, we prove that there is no zero zeros. And um, so that was the start. This is the first instance of low small numbers. So he let him check it for small values of discriminants and it led him to conjecture that this is indeed the case. Uh, and it took a uh, couple of years where he, his academic brother, Polia, he actually disproved this conjecture by constructing the family of discriminants that have uh, zeros in zero one. And uh, it took another 20 years where Chalaka uh, came into play and he still insisted that uh, FD has no real zeros, at least for sufficiently large D. And um, after that, after a year, Halbron came in and he actually again produced pretty much the same proof as Polia, uh, showing that there are discriminants. Uh, there are zeros for many discriminants. So uh, what is that uh, that puzzled all those people who made them in great people interested in this uh, subject? So here is the picture of uh, three uh, of, uh, of the F43. And so this is the zero set that you can see. And uh, uh, well, there are three things here that would immediately sort of back for the explanation. So the first mystery is that one can see that there is an enormous amount of zeros on the unit circle. And um, the second thing uh, is that uh, there are these pairs of zeros that one can see that are sort of symmetric with respect to the unit circle. And this is not uh, really, this mystery is hardly a mystery. It's uh, simply a matter of uh, the fact that uh, if you replace Z by one over Z, then your polynomial just switches and, and it's a circular reciprocal. And the third mystery is, of course, you can see these real zeros that appeared uh, for F43. And uh, the questions that I want to talk about is that uh, I want to talk a little bit about how many of those zeros are on the unit circle and how many of those zeros are real. So uh, let me begin by showing the simple argument, which shows that actually there are a lot of zeros on the unit circle. So here is the argument, uh, which, I, which is from the paper I'll mention on the next slide. So if you take a um, root of unity, p roots of unity, and normalize your faculty polynomial in some certain way, then uh, if we evaluate it at, at this root of unity, one can see that uh, it just becomes the cosine polynomial, really. So the real value. And now if you uh, take instead of roots of unity, the kth power of it, the kth roots of unity, then because of the property of Gauss sums, you just get that this is the uh, original Gauss sum times the sum coefficient. And the key observation is that if the Legendre symbol of k and k plus one are the same, then there is a sign change when you traverse between the kth and k plus first roots of unity. 
And so the number of zeros is simply it, as large as the number of non-signed changes in the Legendre symbol, and which is about a half. And this is the second instance of the law of small numbers. Um, and uh, so if you check it for up, discriminants up to 500, that happened to be all the zeros that lie on the unit circle. But uh, if you take a quite large discriminant, in particular 661, then you can see that there is a little bit more zeros that appear. And um, so in uh, about 20 years ago, Conray, Granville, Poonin, and Sound, uh, what they showed that actually the proportion of these zeros is just a tiny bit bigger uh, than one half. So this is as far as the um, complex zeros are concerned, we, we know what happens. I'm gonna mention one more related uh, result to that, which is a very beautiful problem of Littlewood. And the relation will become maybe clear later. So uh, there is a uh, quite a well-known conjecture of uh, Littlewood about understanding the zeros of cosine polynomials. And uh, so the cosine polynomial is simply the polynomial where you just sum up, you, you pick up your set A and you look at the polynomials uh, with the uh, frequencies in this set. And the question of Littlewood what was, what is the minimal number of zeros on the period for such polynomials? And uh, Littlewood uh, conjectured or, or um, he, he wrote something uh, along the lines, perhaps this is n minus one or not much less. And there has been uh, great progress in this uh, direction. So the, actually it was about 15 years ago when there was a big surprise that Borwin, Erdely, Ferguson, and Locker, they proved, they constructed the polynomials which have much smaller number of zeros. Not n to the two thirds, this is the recent result, but there was n to the five, six before. And as far as this number, uh, how, I think it's a question of Brian Connery, how uh, fast does this number grow? So the lower bound is a re result of Sahasra uh, who showed that this is a triple, at least this triple log. Uh, so faculty polynomial in this, uh, it kind of matches the uh, zone of validity of Littlewood conjecture because the number of is linear. Okay. so. Uh, Complex zeros was sort of understood. And um, the question is like, how many real zeros do we have? And here the guiding conjecture is due to Baker and Montgomery. And they um, also it mentioned for, for prime discriminants in Connery, Granville, Poonin, and Sound. So the conjecture is that it seems likely that there should be roughly log log d zeros for such polynomials for 100% of them. And uh, Baker and uh, Montgomery, they proved uh, 30 years ago um, that uh, actually for almost all discriminant, the number of zeros grows and, um, and grows to infinity. So um, what I wanna tell you is the first result uh, as the, what is the, what one can prove towards the lower bound in this conjecture. And uh, so this is, uh, so the, the result is the following that, uh, well, we can't quite get a log log D zeros in the lower bound, but for 100% of the discriminants, one can get the bound, which is somewhat smaller than log log D. And you need to lose the factor of uh, quadruple log. Uh, and here, yeah, K KLM has nothing to do with the Dutch Royal Airline. Uh, so this is, um, um, okay. So what about the upper bounds? So the upper bounds um, in the survey of Erdely, the uh, conjecture or what is stated is that actually the bounds for the upper, the upper bounds that are available are not much better, uh, are not better at all than uh, for the Littlewood polynomials. And this is square root of D that we've seen on the first slide. So the next, uh, so the question is what can one prove about um, the upper bounds and the first uh, result that I would like to tell you about is that uh, if under GRH for a good proportion, not quite positive proportion, but for uh, n to the one minus epsilon fundamental discriminants, um, one can beat this bound of square root to the d to the one third. Uh, 
And uh, if you are not a believer uh, then uh, in GRH, then uh, perhaps then one can get worse bound, uh, worse saving on the number of discriminants, but uh, um, the d to the one quarter zeros for the uh, fundamental discriminants. So before I uh, tell you something about more refined scale, I'd like to discuss the proof uh, or the ideas how one go about proving this theorem and perhaps then return to some more refined scale of the zeros. So um, the first idea uh, of the proof, it's uh, hugely based on the work of Baker and, uh, and Montgomery. They had a, a very nice observation that, uh, well, if you differentiate the um, Laplace of the Mellin transform, then what you get on the left hand side is you, you can write it in terms of the um, logarithm derivative of the L function. And uh, so, if uh, the now, if one wants to understand the zeros, then the fact uh, which is present in the Carlin's work, but it also in Poly and Segur. So, if one wants to understand the number of zeros of the function is not smaller than the number of the number sorry the number of sign changes of the function is at least as large as the number of sign changes of the Laplace transform of that and uh, so the Laplace transform here on the right hand side you can see the Laplace transform and so in order to lower bound the number of zeros of f of d it's uh, enough to get a good good bounds on the number of sign changes on the left hand side. So um, here is the rough plan. So the goal right now is to get the good number of sign changes on the left hand side. And uh, the plan, um, so here is the rough plan of, of the proof. Um, so the statistical study of the so what happens is that L prime over L via the explicit formula can be usually well approximated by a long sum over primes. And the problem is that uh, of this uh, is that this sum is too long. So the second step would be to approximate uh, to show that for many discriminants, actually this sum can be localized within the short interval within a short number uh, of primes. And if you have a short Dirichlet polynomial, then uh, one would wanna define the random model and uh, uh, compare this Dirichlet character to the random multiplicative function appropriately chosen. And now the random model would converge to this certain, to the suitable normal variable and uh, the problem is that right now is that these normal variables are not independent. But if you make a good choice of the points um, as size, then um, these random variables will happen to be independent. And the key for the quantitative bounds uh, right now would be a good discrepancy bounds between. So uh, I, I must mention that uh, in the random, if you have a random Gaussian vector of ra random variables, then you expect there are quite a few sign changes. And so the uh, idea to quantitative bounds would be to uh, show, oops, disappeared, would be to show a good discrepancy bounds between the random model and approximation. So what I wanna do right now is to talk a little bit uh, more detailed about what's uh, what what's gonna happen. Um, so here is the first step, which is the approximation step. So this is uh, you. One can ignore the parameters here. So the key th here is that um, if one is given the L function. Uh, the L prime over L, then uh, by using the explicit formula, this is very classical, one can actually write it as a sum over primes. And uh, that happens for many, many fundamental discriminants. So um, 
once we um, have this, the problem, as I mentioned, the, the sum over primes is rather long. So the next step would be to localize it. And again, one can see here that there is a parameters floating around. But the key here is that for most of the fundamental discriminants, what happens is that uh, the L prime over L can be approximated by a, a short Dirichlet polynomial. So if you fix X, this sum US and VS are going to be quite short. And uh, the way uh, this is proved uh, usually is via moments estimates and large sieve inequality. So once we have this, once we have that this, this is a short sum, so the idea, as I promised before, would be to approximate it uh, by, the, uh, by the random model. And what is the good random model here? Well, you would, you would think that the um, characters uh, are it's with probability a half, you have plus one and probability a half, you have minus one. So um, this, there's, there's some confusion of the variables in the last slide. Perhaps you, it's meant to be u of x and v of x. So the range depends on x, not s. Uh, actually, u of s and v of x, they do depend on x. There's an X and there's an S. So do they depend on S at all? Oh yeah, I, I see what, what you mean. Uh, so S is, so I should have made more clear, I guess. So S is the depends on X. So the first line here, unfortunately my tablet doesn't work so I, I can't really point out. So S, uh, if I understand your question correctly. So S is the function of X. I oh, right, right, right. Okay, so it makes sense. No, it's actually a very good point uh, to stop here. So the key is that because we are aiming for the quantitative bounds, it is very important in every uh, intermediate step to have a, a good dependence on X because we would wanna come very, very close to the half line. So this is exactly the key in, uh, in these uh, intermediate results is to make everything uh, explicit in terms of X. Um, so, right, so perhaps I, I should have written here X, okay. Um, all right, so here is the, I'll go back to this. So here is the right model, uh, or the, so this model has been used extensively in many, many uh, works in the subject, um, in particular Elliot and Montgomery Vaughan and uh, Granville Sound and, and many other people. So it turns out that the right model, instead of just flipping the coin with probability one half is to adjust it a little bit. And the reason is that characters modulo P squared for fundamental discriminant, they occupy P squared minus one uh, residue classes. And for uh, about P minus one of them, uh, they hit zero. So the probability of hitting zero is roughly one over p plus one, and the rest splits up evenly between a half, uh, between a minus one and one. So the um, character happened to be modeled well by this random model. And as I said uh, before, so the question now we have our short Dirichlet polynomial. And uh, if you just stick here the random model, then, um, they would converge, these random variables would converge to the central normal distribution with the variance. And you can notice here that when you come too close to the half line, this uh, variance explodes. So it's very important to control this variance close to the one, uh, to the half line. Okay, so uh, once we have this comparison, uh, as I promised before, one needs to, so this is the key for the quantitative bounds, is to have a good comparison between the distribution of the uh, random model and the deterministic part. And uh, here comes the, uh, so here comes the part um, of the comparing this. So um, now we have, what we have, if we sample our polynomial at different points, which uh, with such that these ranges do not intersect, then we would get a vector. For, on one hand, we would get a deterministic vector of these Dirichlet polynomials sampled in different points. 
And on the other hand, we would get a similar random vector. So the um, goal to compare the moment, the uh, discrepancy is to define this rectangular discrepancy, which is uh, the following. So you look at the difference between what you have for the characters and the difference between the random model. And you look, uh, you take the supremum over all rectangular boxes when you move your box around. Um, so it turns out I have time, but I, I uh, thought that I will not talk much about that. But here is the, uh, so using the um, techniques of Lamzuri and Lester in Red Review. So recently they, they've developed a very nice uh, methods for quantitative bounds uh, for the um, universality theorems. And so using these methods for the analytic methods, one can actually uh, prove that the discrepancy between the random model and uh, the deterministic part is upper bounded by um, one over log x to the one fifth is not very important. But uh, once this is assembled, so now we, ha we have a random model, we have a deterministic part. And uh, now, as I promised you before, so here is the quick summary of what's going to happen or what, what happened. So we take uh, points that are very well separated and such that x, uh, such that our random variables changes signs with size. So it's not just enough to get a sign change, but you need some size to compensate the gamma factors. But uh, so we, we can choose them with high probability, they will change sign as a Gaussians. And then as we've seen before, uh, the for almost all Ds, uh, this random model well approximates uh, the deterministic one that what we needed before. And once uh, this is assembled, therefore you have a good sign changes in this random vector, so here is the polynomials. And uh, that gives you a good uh, number of sign changes in L prime over F. And that gives you a good number of changes in the FD. So uh, I don't wanna get too much into uh, technical details with that. And that, uh, instead, I will tell you a little bit more about the upper bounds. So uh, how would you prove the upper bounds on the number of zeros of, of uh, polynomials? Well, uh, it's in some sense simpler, but simply because we don't know, I mean, at least we don't know much how to do that. So um, the good way or a way would be to go back to the beginning of 20th century uh, and uh, recall the Jensen's formula. So the Jensen's formula tells you that if I if I have a point and I want to upper bound the number of zeros inside the ball around this point, then um, as long as I know that on some larger ball, the polynomial is not too large. And as long as I know that uh, in, at this point, this value is not too small. And also that the circles are some, somewhat separated. So R is not close to the little r. Then I can upper bound the number of zeros inside the disk. And then the natural first idea would be, of course, well, you take your interval 0, 1. And you just want to cover it by one big circle and uh, say that uh, by one circle and uh, say that, uh, okay, upper bound that. But the problem is that with this is that if you take the small circle to cover the whole interval, then the bigger circle will stick out of it and we will lose control over the maximum uh, value of it. And so the way to overcome this difficulty is to instead use the cover line. So instead of covered by one circle, you would want to cover it by several of them. Um, and uh, so here is the uh, roughly how it's done and what we need for that. So the, um, if I pick up the points X alpha and X beta normalized in, the, in this way, then um, so for many discriminants, 
what happens is that, so what we wanna do is we wanna take, let's say two circles. And so if I have uh, two circles, as long as I have a size of my faculty polynomial at point X alpha and at point X beta, I can do the following. I can cover it up. I can use the Jensen's formula in one of them. And I can also use the Jensen's formula on the, another one. And the point being is that if you take a circle, second circle to be small enough, then you don't stick out too much. And therefore uh, you, you, you would be hoping to have a control over this big circle. Um, so in practice, so the problem is to produce the simultaneously large values at the points and X alpha and X beta for different points um, of alpha and beta. So um, I, um, oh, that's exactly what I was saying. So uh, if we take a, a set of the discriminants for which the values at the point X alpha and X beta are large, then as long as you can, the way to show that there is uh, enough of these discriminants is um, to show that the first mixed moment is large and the second mixed moment is small. Um, and one prototypical, uh, so that, that becomes a problem of bounding the mixed character sums. And of course, uh, so I, I'm going to give you the prototypical example here is uh, the bound for the first moment of, of this size, of the size of x plus alpha over 2 beta over 2, and the bound on the second moment um, on the size of that size. Now, in practice, what we do is we actually don't use two circles, but we use three circles. And so it's a matter of executing the Poisson summation formula and the um, um, bounds for the character sums to get it, uh, to get the right bounds. And that's what gives the numerical results that I've uh, told you about before. Um, Right, and the, actually the numerical results uh, are going to be, so you sort of use all the standard um, bounds that you can imagine for that. Okay, so what I wanna do uh, in the, this um, is to uh, basically in the last, uh, quite fast actually. Uh, so uh, in the last moment is to, uh, go back to the original question of faculty and uh, uh, so understand how wrong or how right actually faculty was. And uh, uh, so the question is, well, okay, we know that there are, for most of the discriminants, there are a lot of zeros, but are there those for which there are no zeros for actually faculty was right? And there is a more, uh, much more general heuristic of uh, uh, Peter Sarnak uh, about what is called totally positive um, L functions. And uh, as an outcome of this heuristic one also has that um, actually there should exist infinitely many of faculty poly of discriminants for which faculty polynomial actually doesn't have zeros, zero one. And uh, well, the another way, so this heuristic is done by comparing it to the random model, but uh, one way of thinking about uh, these polynomials without zeros is actually by um, looking at this simple factorization. So the t equals one is always a zero. And uh, so if we factor out uh, one minus T, so what we have as an output, the coefficients become character sums. So the question is uh, if the character sums are positive and don't say have sign change, then you immediately have that the number of zeros, uh, then there is no real zeros. So I want to show you, uh, a movie directed by, oh, unfortunately, um, I don't know why, but this movie doesn't. 
I want to show you a movie of these character sums which do not actually change signs. So this is the movie. Well, perhaps maybe not too fast. But so these are the character sums um, with the discriminants uh, around to, to 200. A thousand which uh, do not change signs and therefore for all these characters with these conductors you actually don't have zeros for the fact of the polynomial and you can see you can pick your favorite sh shape you can see that there is a lot of different shapes that these characters actually achieve so this is what is pictured here is the character sum up to the size of the conductor scaled by the square root of log a uh, square root of q um, as a, a natural scaling for this. So uh, yes, you can see that there is like very much different shapes for it. I'm not going to do that more. And so um, what I want to tell you another in the last actually a bit is that uh, if you're willing to uh, give up on the not taking the full interval from zero one then um, there is one can produce actually discriminants and this is quite simple one can produce discriminants for which the faculty polynomial will not have zero so what i mean by that if um, that uh, if you're willing to go from the zero to one over power of log then this, uh, then one can cook up a good proportion of discriminants which will not have zeros at this polynomial. And I can tell you, so what, what is also in progress, it hasn't been written down, but um, uh, the, uh, actually if one is willing to go on the one over log scare, then for a hundred percent of the discriminants, the number of zeros is going to be upper bounded by log log squared. So this is the range, the range one over log n is the range where you can first time see this conjectured upper bound of log log, at least of the order of log log. So to compare it, this is uh, to compare it, why is that somewhat better than uh, for the uh, Littlewood polynomial? So with Littlewood polynomial, the results of Borben, Erlden, and Koch uh, give that the intervals up to the size of one over log x have at most log x zeros up to this polynomial, up to uh, up to this point. So here the interval is somewhat wider, and the zeros uh, there is a smaller number of zeros. It's not not zeros at all. Uh, so I actually think that uh, I have uh, another time. So this proposition is quite simple uh, and not technical unlike the previous ones. Uh, so I will give, I will try to describe to you the proof of that. That was too fast with it. Um, so the, the key, how would one construct these discriminants uh, with the, a lot of discriminants for which you don't have zeros? Well, um, is to construct a lot of discriminants for which you point towards, for which the character is equal to one for, uh, for until uh, quite a long point onwards. And so here's the simple lemma, which uh, says that the number of such discriminants, if you fix your parameter y, then the number of such discriminants is at least a quarter of log x. Um, so the proof is quite uh, simple. You take a um, vector of plus minus ones. And what, what you do is you prescribe the values of, for a given vector, you look at the values at the discriminants, which give you, as a Legendre symbol, gives you exactly the values of VI. And now the, the question, the, the key thing is that if you take two prime, two, two value, two primes, so if we take a two primes with the same vector of the values, then when you multiply these two primes, you get the same, uh, you get a uh, value of the character one. So this is what I've been, um, that's what I was talking about. So if you take 
two primes which coincide on the small primes, uh, the Legendre symbols, then the value is one. And uh, so then the number of, so by multiplicativity, of course, is that the number, uh, this is going to be one on all integers up to y. And uh, PNT uh, prime number theorem and uh, combinatorial argument just simply says that the number of such discriminants is at least as a number of combinations of choosing from these sets uh, vectors with the same um, Legendre symbol. And this is at least x over well, squared x. And uh, now, so I don't have uh, another slide on that, but uh, now once you constructed uh, the characters that point in the same direction, it's very likely, it's very uh, easy to prove that the discriminant, the, the polynomial will not have zero until some point. And the uh, small caveat where you get this extra win. Uh, so for people who looked at this, uh, Clearly, see that there is the square root of e. This comes from the Burgess bound, uh, from the Burgess bound, from the on the these quadratic non residue. So one can use the Vinogradov trick to boost it a little bit, to say that uh, you can actually do a little bit better than that. So I will not talk about that right now. Um, I guess I am done, and thank you. This is the now the site, which is thank you for your attention.